Um, so I'm Peter Brantland, Hypothesis, and um, many other places before then. Um, and I just wanted to start with this uh, really interesting thing that just came out on uh, via a friend at Paid Content. Um, and this has very little to do directly with my talk, except for the fact that this is a, a put together Bible or, or Gospels. And um, uh, evidently, the second image has annotations there by a king. And, and the comment was, um, sorry, going back up. Uh, the annotation on the second image below records King Charles's disagreement with the way that the little Gidding group had arranged the text of the Sermon of the Mount. And in the third image, Charles points out another error and then crosses out his annotation, writing, I confess that I was too hasty, for it is very well, but too little omissions that I have marked. Um, so here's a, a very interesting uh, recorded annotation and then um, edit of and deletion of an annotation um, in, a, in a physical artifact. Uh, so I think that that's really interesting. Um, OK, so what I want to talk about is uh, the work that Hypothesis is doing, and particularly the work that we're doing in the context of a broader community effort at the W3C um, in the Open Annotation Collaboration, um, which uh, is co-headed by someone in the audience, Rob Sanderson. Um, where is Rob now? There he is, yay. Um, my poor recording can't figure out what I'm pointing to, but that's all right. Uh, so um, I'm going to take the advice of Ed Summers and do something um, really kind of crazy, which is start with a demo. So um, this may or may not work, because this code is really new. Um, uh, basically got it yesterday afternoon. Uh, so we'll see if it works. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to try to make an annotation in this PDF, uh, which is uh, from the new academic journal um, eLife. Um, and uh, then I'm going to toggle back to um, an HTML version of the article. Um, and hopefully, we'll see the annotation there. Now, a couple quick things. Um, I'm going to use different, slightly different uh, technologies for the PDF and the uh, uh, HTML version in two different browsers. And I just want to explain that real quickly. Um, it, they'll merge, first of all. But um, secondly, uh, Firefox, starting with version 19, is now shipping with something called PDFJS installed. Um, so PDFJS is a JavaScript library that uh, is rendering PDF natively in the browser. Um, and this enables web control over the PDF um, in, a, in a really nice, web-friendly way. And, and so this is, PDFJS has been in, in the works for a while, but this is now um, sort of working code in the browser. Um, this isn't in Chrome or other browsers, but similar functionality is expected. There are ways of importing PDFJS as a handler into other browsers. Um, and, and so that's one of the things we're looking at. But PDFJS in Firefox makes PDF a very interesting experience um, uh, in interesting ways. So um, in the HTML version, I'm going I'm to use Chrome. And in Chrome, um, also very new code on our part, uh, we have uh, an actual extension loaded. So here in Firefox, I have a bookmarklet. And in Chrome for HTML, I have a very brand new, newly minted extension. Um, not in the Chrome store, uh, so don't try this at home. You won't find it. Um, so this is really all quite, quite new, quite raw. Um, and so briefly, what Hypothesis is, is um, we are a small company of three full-time individuals and a cast of many others who are working to um, build on the W3C open annotation specification to construct a software stack from the storage layer up through the UI that will enable open annotation of web documents. And by a document, I mean in the broad sense of any media representation. So we hope we're obviously demos work best with text, but we definitely want to be enabling the um, uh, annotation of images, of uh, video, of uh, 
data, um, genetics data, um, protein data, uh, numerical data. Um, so as long as it's a referenceable object, uh, we're trying to create software that enables um, the creation of annotations on those documents that are themselves referenceable uh, through, uh, through URLs, ultimately, um, and uh, uh, that enable uh, cross-document uh, contextualization. Uh, so there's a, a lot more beyond that that has to be done in order to create a workflow around annotation, some of which I'll touch on briefly. Uh, and another major component of this, particularly in a scholarly uh, context, but also in the broader web, is, is reputation and identity. And so coming up with an, a reputation um, metric is also something we're very much concerned with. And again, I'll get to that in a little bit later. But let me demonstrate here. Um, so I am uh, presently just signed in on a test account, and here you can see on the right-hand margin um, indications of annotations. The coloring suggests that there is, is just a heat map, essentially a heat map, um, indicating that there are multiple annotations in the document. And uh, if you point to any one um, pointer, then um, the side panel will expand, um, and you'll be able to see uh, the details of the particular annotation. Um, these are scholarly annotations, but, but uh, you know, just a caveat that they are um, ones that we've constructed. So this is not a real conversation among scholars. This is a pseudo conversation, but just to give you a flavor of what this might look like. Um, and then if uh, these annotations themselves had further comments, um, then they, you could expand these by clicking on them um, and so forth. Um, so we're building various kinds of navigation here, um, and I think more apparent will be in the HTML version will be some of the editing controls that we're building in for um, editing and deleting um, a user's own um, um, annotations and so forth. Um, but, uh, and, I, and I will caveat, this is all very sensitive still to um, uh, to loading and priority, and, and we're really working on a lot of that. Uh, but I will um, make a draft annotation here, and, and here you see I'm, I'm making this annotation public, um, and um, spelling complex words under stress, never a, uh, <laughs> never a fun point, right? Um, and just, you know, no, we do support markdown uh, syntax, if folks know what that is. Uh, it's just a uh, simple way of embedding HTML layout instructions. Um, so I'll save that there. Okay, and then um, collapse that. Um, so, so now I, I have an annotation there. Um, which you can see there. Okay, so now I'm going to do the risky thing here, okay? And uh, let me come over to uh, the Chrome version, and I'm going to um, reload this because it's been a while. And this also forces a, a sync. Um, the, the extension is um, noted here. Um, let me see if I'm still signed in, and it will take a few minutes to load. Uh, there's a little bit more functionality in the bookmarklet yet um, compared to the extension in terms of some of the navigation controls. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, th this down button, we want to navigate to the next available annotation if there's not one on a page and, and so forth. Um, but let's uh, see. Uh, see if I can find, you may have to help me find uh, where it was that I See, I should have kept better note. Where the heck was my own? Uh... Annotation. Do you remember? <laughs> uh, 
Aha, okay. Voila. Okay, so here I am. So a comment that I made <laughs> in the PDF version is now showing up in eLive's HTML version of the article. Um, now this is obviously painful for us as software developers, but highly worthwhile uh, because uh, so much of the scholarly literature is still represented in PDF instantiations. And it's, it's also the kind of, of cross-format um, leakage that we want to embody um, beyond strictly HTML and PDF, but trying to figure out over time how to uh, establish linkages between content that has strong association, right? So if you're making an annotation in one scholarly representation that has a close surrogate and another format or another instantiation, we want to be able, if appropriate, to, uh, to overlay annotations when, when appropriate. So that is all obviously potentially hairy uh, problem, but, um, but this is a, a path word. Now this is aided um, in this hand by, by very clean um, naming um, of, by eLife of the HTML and PDF uh, surrogates of the article. Um, and so obviously to the extent that that is uh, smooth and regularized, uh, we are greatly aided uh, in our work to do this. And most of the, certainly the newer journals uh, like PLOS, PeerJ, eLife are very good at this. Um, older journals or larger publishers that have more complicated workflows, this gets to be more of a problem. Um, and so one of the calls in the greater publishing world is to establish you know, higher um, naming affinity uh, between representations of their content. Uh, and that is not always the case, unfortunately. So, okay, demo done, yay. Um, so now I just wanna go through quickly, um, you know, what are we about and what are our aims um, and to draw in a little bit of conversation about, um, you know, how annotations might work and what the challenges are. Uh, and I, I hope to be able to fly through this fast enough so that we have ample time for some discussion and questions. Um, okay, so um, Hypothesis, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is a very small not-for-profit um, with the audacious goal of um, trying to enable the annotation of all knowledge on the web. Um, why start something new unless you can be audacious? And so uh, that's why we started here. Um, this is my call out to Rob, um, which he will appreciate. Uh, this is actually close by our offices. Uh, we are in San Francisco um, on one of the piers, uh, actually underneath the Bay Bridge. Um, and so this lovely Corsair was uh, floating underneath the bridge at the time. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of historical uh, sort of antecedents to digital annotation. Um, and, you know, there's, there's perhaps on, to some extent an obvious, well, why is it worthwhile trying to create a system that embeds inline representation of engagement uh, as opposed to sort of the existing footnote kind of commenting that we have now through systems like Discuss and, uh, or Discuss uh, and, and others like that, that you're familiar with in blogging software. And you know, I think it just helps to point out how things could be if they had been different, right? And so you know, this is just a, a copy at, from NARA of the Magna Carta. Um, and it's just you know, an interesting thought experiment to think about you know, if this had been born in an age where annotations could have been recorded, to think about, um, you know, what kinds of discussions would have led to the final elaboration of each of these principles, and there were many of them, and what would have been the contextual, um, you know, uh, disputes that finally led down to the settling of that document as it is, and which was greatly revised over time. And, and, you know, and yet that struggle was lost. We can only recapitulate it through our examination of the revisions over time as they occurred and through you know, very secondary materials relating to the conflict uh, between um, uh, the feudal entities involved. And so obviously if we'd been able to capture that discussion, uh, we would have been able to um, understand 
quite a bit more about the intellectual context in which that document had arisen. And, and yet we've struggled with this. This is, uh, uh, this is sort of the or example of print-based annotation, um, this page from the Talmud. And, and you can see you know, that this was the representation of, of, this is the original context, or the content in the center, with the annotation arrayed around it, right? So this is you know, how you know, one very formalized aspect of annotation was recorded in print. And clearly, we can do so much better um, in a digital environment, and and I you know I, I hate to call out uh, this you know one individual uh, Ben of our Bush, but really it was uh, you know during World War II when uh, when Bush was very active in the Allied war effort and and very actually instrumental in the Manhattan Project. Um, who, who did write about the sensing of a networked age. And it's worth noting that sort of the network mentality is really different than a non-networked mentality. To, to be able to accept a distributed form of communication around the planet, or to presume that that might be the case, leads one to different kinds of insight and discovery then might be the case when you cannot envision that. And, and so it is in that context, in that frame, that Bush was able to write that text and, and describing how a researcher might navigate different findings and say, occasionally he inserts a comment of his own, either linking it to the main trail or joining it to a side trail to a particular item, and assuming that that itself would be referenceable and followable by others in a way that an author of the Talmud could never have envisioned in this manner. So in this age, we're seeing a lot of different kinds of annotation efforts emerge on the web. Um, and they're trying in many different niches to come up with many different kinds of functionality. And it's really an interesting process to watch. Um, I think you know one really interesting bellwether was the funding of this organization, Rap Genius, um, by Andreessen Horowitz. And Rep Genius intends to do what it suggests, which is to provide annotation of rap lyrics by communities that are informed of the meaning of those lyrics and to provide context that's available um, in Wikipedia or other sources of, for example, urban lore or other culturally uh, aware materials. Um, but for us at Hypothesis in the open annotation com uh, community, what was notable was Andreessen's own annotation of the funding notice, in which Mark said in 1993, when Eric Ben and I were coding Mosaic, we had actually built in to one of the early Mosaic builds support for what they called group annotations, and realizing that that would be a necessary component of a World Wide Web. But because a distributed storage layer at that time didn't exist that could provide accessibility to those annotations or to their storage, they ended up pulling it out. And so he says at the bottom of this note, I often wonder how the internet would have turned out differently if users had been able to annotate everything, to add new layers of knowledge to all knowledge on and on. So 20 years, in a sense, you know, we've not had that capability, even though we've seen the need for it. And there have been a lot of reasons why we haven't been able to build it. It's not trivial. And it's not just the lack of a distributed storage layer. It's, it's this litany of things that I have on the screen, which ranges from um, prior to the W3C efforts, no predominant standards, um, the, the problems that are discussed often in this environment at CNI, of the lack of, of document or entity identification, identity management, um, the problems of integrating this with publishing workflow, um, and then really the biggie, what's called the cold start problem, of, of generating enough material uh, within a particular domain so that it becomes attractive to continue to engage in that domain. Right? And yet this is a solvable problem. I, one look at Twitter will inform you that, uh, that this is done successfully in some context, somewhat surprisingly, um, indeed, to uh, software creators uh, at times. 
So, you know, we take great heart from that, and, um, and so that's where hypothesis is coming in. So we are, we are trying to build a reference implementation of software that will help institutions, help organizations start working with annotation in domains to, to jumpstart, to, to overcome, in part, that cold start problem. Um, we are funded through a variety of sources right now. Uh, we have actually initially started off with some Kickstarter funding, uh, but we have major funding from Sloan. Um, we have also funding from Shuttleworth and the Knight Foundation. Um, and Andrew W. Mellon uh, is generously funding uh, a conference that we're putting on uh, in April this month. Uh, the, the goals of open annotation are to build an annotation system which are standards-based, where the annotations are interoperable, where they're addressable, where they work across representations and formats, such as the PDF HTML demo that I provided at first, uh, and the ability to point into documents to reference specific sections of texts, um, certainly enabling through referenceability, you know, a cross-network contextualization, enabling threaded discussions, and particularly resilient to changes in document structure or flow. Uh, the conference that Mellon is funding is called I Annotate. It's next week, actually, uh, now scarily soon. Um, and it's a small conference by invitation, about 100 people. And the, the idea there is to pull together as many use cases as possible uh, to generate an understanding of how annotation might work not only in scholarly literature, but also in domains like open government, um, data handling, journalism, um, and other areas where sustained engagement of a discussion might have high value um, and, and might be um, uh, productive in terms of uh, use cases uh, that help us generate uh, really the parameters of the software solution that we're trying to provide. So I just want to introduce quickly a few sort of basic terms. Uh, those of you familiar with the annotation model at W3C uh, will be familiar with this. Um, but you know, just to grab a certain piece of text, this happens to be a, a discussion of optics. And the annotation is notable uh, because it was made by an individual named Sir Isaac Newton. Um, and so you know, we provide basic. Uh, naming the, of these elements uh, the annotation itself is referred to as a body of an annotation object. Um, the target is, is the actual manuscript. And then there, if there's a particular component that's being annotated, a particular section of material, uh, then we can refer to a selector that demarcates uh, what that annotation is actually referencing. So this is just a sort of top level terminology. Um, this is a schematic of the uh, W3C open annotation, actually now slightly dated, but it gives you an idea of the RDF schema that lays out the specification um, that Rob will be happy to volunteer further explication of, uh, should you so desire. Um, many of you have been, I'm sure, fortunate not to have to consider documents like this, and may you continue to be so blessed. Um, but the RDF schema is, or the, uh, uh, um, the work that's gone into laying out the specification has tried to encompass a wide variety of use cases. And so by inclusion or removal of various elements, you can actually convey a wide number of potential types of annotation. So a completely specified annotation um, you know, is what we consider to be an annotation in the context of a document uh, making a comment on a specific point of text. Uh, and you could add in further descriptors or metadata to describe the intent of the annotation and so forth. Um, if you leave out a selection, um, then you're essentially making a comment on a work. Um, if you are simply um, uh, you know, without making uh, an annotation body, without making an explicit commentary, you're highlighting text um, by including uh, the, the target reference and a highlight specification or a selection specification. And you can also create, in essence, a bookmark pointing to an entity uh, of, of interest. 
And so you can, you can see here how an annotation system specified in W3C could interrelate to a Zotero or Mendeley or citation system um, and how citations, traditional academic citations might be um, referenced within an annotation environment. And you know, it's worth pointing just this basic thing that we take for granted. We can point to documents, right? We have you know, what consumers understand as URLs that point to the top level of a document, and that's a well-known system. But, but targeting that selector, naming that selector, is not something that's specified in the web context in any regularized way for any kind of media. Right? Even like in video, you can do timestamps, but that's not a very resilient system. Uh, there might be ways of approaching video through Mozilla's Popcorn, which is another, another JavaScript implementation that deals with some of the um, characteristics of a video stream. But, but this, this elemental problem is something that all of us in annotation have to solve in one way or another. And it is true for any kind of, of media. Um, you know, genetic material, uh, protein material, all have to have domain-specific ways of denoting selections uh, in order to provide a targeted um, context for an annotation. And, and, you know, as I referenced at the beginning, we do want this resilience also in terms of format linkages and format associations. So, you know, being able to uh, associate a PDF or an EPUB with an HTML representation, for example, in a world of, of textually dominant documents is something that's a priority and something that has to come not only through algorithmic matching, machine-based uh, determination, but also needs to come through um, you know, uh, uh, refactoring of publishing workflows and, and publishing not just in terms of with a capital P, but lowercase p, to the extent that we're all publishers, we all need to, to work towards systems that engineer in as much um, syntax glue as possible to aid machine um, um, you know, uh, conveyance of, of that similarity. And we also want, in a context of an annotation, to be resilient to, to changes uh, here, just a spelling example. And so we have to figure out fuzzy matching that works to grab, in this case, in, in a textual context, you know, prefix, postfix um, kind of, of uh, bookmark so that a text string cannot be identified um, regardless of its eventual location in a document. Um, and that could be very well the case even if, for example, a whole paragraph moves from one location to another, um, many commercial annotation systems that work within a given domain, uh, like ReadMill, which is an ebook um, a passage selection system, uh, do as much of all they can, of all the approaches that they can, in order to ensure that the user gets to uh, the representation of the passage uh, that they've selected. So that could be you know, working with the DOM of the document that could be using XPath, that could be using fuzzy matching depending upon the context and so forth. So just a few minutes on, on how this would work in a journal context. There, there are a couple of obvious use cases in sort of traditional scholarly literature. Um, one of those is in peer review. And, and particularly in a peer review context, um, reputation and identity become really important. And in any at-scale annotation system, we recognize um, that not only is identity a critical factor, but reputation is an issue. And an annotation system is going to be subject to, uh, to spam, to trolling, um, and other um, um, maleficent activity. And so some of that can be uh, uh, detected through machine algorithms. Uh, by patterns of behavior or patterns of expression. Uh, some of it may require certain kinds of moderation, and certain kinds of moderation may be highly desirable in a publishing context, uh, given a, a particular workflow 
uh, again, in the general context of moving an article through a submission process. So in a, in a pre-publication peer review, um, you know, there are lots of questions that would have to be addressed uh, that are addressed manually now. But if you are implementing an annotation system, you have to think about whole document comments versus commenting on particular elements of text, um, the scoring of both the review and the reviewer, um, whether or not you have a, an open peer review process, a closed peer review process, or a hybrid between those. Uh, you have to consider whether or not you're assigning reviewers in your workflow or through growing use of reputation, whether you are um, designating reviewers through uh, selection or, or sponsoring self-selection of uh, review and so forth. So annotation is not in and of itself peer review in a box. There is a whole set of existing workflow issues that would have to be considered. Post-pub peer review is more similar to open discourse on the net and is really, I wouldn't say trivial, um, but it is a, a much more straightforward case uh, that is more susceptible to uh, some of the, the spam or trolling um, cases, uh, but in, an, in another situation is, is more easily controlled. We have more experience with this kind of system uh, just through open commenting on blogs. So that's it for my formal presentation. Um, this is the team of individuals that's been working on it, uh, either in some or part. Um, many people are, are beginning to contribute this. This is just the software level. You know, Rob will tell you that the W3C community is extremely active and very highly engaged. Um, and, and that is the specification component of this work. And that's it for me. So I welcome your questions. Thank you.